A very warm welcome to First Light Spotlight, Networked Beings. I'm curator and photographer Mario Popham, and I will be your host this evening. This is one of several First Light talks expanding on the inaugural First Light project, which celebrates Northern graduates of 2020. Created by Waterside, Trafford and Open Eye Gallery Liverpool, the First Light exhibition is currently on display at Castlefield Gallery New Art Spaces in Warrington until the 4th of July. And our First Light Tilt publication follows closely behind launching later in June. First Light aims to reflect the diversity of photography as practiced today at a time when given the circumstances, we may all be reimagining our futures. Tonight, we'll be talking about Nature's Internet by Tallulah Greenwood. The recent leaps in AI technology have coincided with a renewed interest in the extraordinary life and habits of fungi, whose part in the, whose part in the interconnected ecology of the natural world was previously underestimated. Using internet sourced imagery and AI technology, artist Tallulah Greenwood proposes a connecting thread between our understanding of the organic networks that connects living things and the ever increasing capacity for humans to establish new synthetic networks as a means of creation. Before we introduce our speakers, just a bit of housekeeping. As usual, we've enabled the chat function and the Q&A box below. So please do ask questions or comment throughout the event and we will answer your questions at the end. This is a safe space and we ask that you're respectful to us and all other attendees. So without further ado, I'll introduce our guest tonight. Uh, we're joined by Tallulah Greenwood, artist. Hello, Tallulah. Uh, so Tallulah Greenwood is an artist who combines photographic practices with the implementation of a broad range of technologies, such as the internet, programming and artificial intelligence. Her work focuses on social and economic issues that confront us today and that pose urgent questions for us in a new, in a new future. Tallulah likes to challenge her audience to find new perspectives and new ways to highlight the rapidly changing society in which we live. She has recently graduated with a degree in BA Photography at the Manchester School of Art. And we're also joined by writer and artist Matthew Thomas. Hello, Matthew. Hello. 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 <laughs> uh, so Matthew Thomas is a photographer with over 30 years experience in PR events and live music with clients as diverse as the Blue Coat, RDC and RLPO. He has had two one-man exhibitions exploring themes such as the Fibonacci sequence, re-photography and psychogeography. He has explored media such as QR codes, slow film, lenticular prints, coding. He is a qualified computer programmer, online only exhibitions, and has always been interested in utilizing digital imaging technologies. He is currently studying uh, MA, an MA in photography course at the Falmouth University. Uh, we're also joined by Richard Page, artist and educator. Hello, Richard. Uh, Richard Page is a photographic artist based in Manchester and is currently program leader of BA Photography at Manchester Metropolitan University. He received the Jail with Photography Award in 2004 and his artist monograph, What We Already Know, was published by F Photography in 2007. Employing a variety of approaches, his work considers how space is implicitly bound up with history, memory, and our psychological relationship with place. Richard is currently working on a project in Spain, The Dialogue of the Dogs, which was exhibited at Francesca Maffeo Gallery in 2017. So it's lovely to have you all here. Uh, First, I think it will be great as the focus of, the, of, of this uh, edition is Tallulah's work, which is featured in the exhibition. I think it'd be great for the audience to, to have a sneak peek at the work. So this is Nature's Internet by Tallulah Greenwood. So Tallulah, as we can see, it's quite, very different work to everything else in the exhibition. It's, it's photography, but perhaps not as many audiences know it. Can you tell us what we're actually looking at here? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, the process of nature's internet uh, uses a machine learning model called a GAM, which stands for a generative adversarial network. This is a type of machine learning that combines two artificial intelligence networks that interact with each other to create ultra realistic looking images. Um, firstly, I created a data set consisting of around 9,000 images, um, and a data set is a collection of sets of information, so it could be a set of cars, a set of trees, um, a set of plants. Um, both networks are trained with the same data set. One is known as the generative, and it's tasked with creating variations of the images you've already seen. Um, this could be a mushroom with an extra stalk. 
And then the, no, the second um, is known as the discriminator, which must identify whether that image belongs to the original data set or whether it's a fake image produced by the generative adversary network. The discriminator questions whether the machine is real enough. Um, and over time, the generative adversary network gets so good at producing images that it ends up being impossible for it to discriminate the discriminating partner to detect any forgery. So the final moving image piece is in a sense a machine's imagination and the system developing an independent ability to make sense of objects uh, within the world. So you, you're basically teaching this machine how to, yeah. how to produce yeah. brand new mushrooms. Yeah. And the more mushrooms you feed it, the more accurate it becomes. Is that, is that, is that close to it? Yeah, it's very close. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it's like a trial and error kind of experiment, isn't it, that you're putting it through? And I guess that's, that's by and large how humans learn as well. So there are, there are kind of parallels with how we uh, make sense of the world. Um, was it quite a revelation when you saw what it, what it was producing? Yeah, it was. This was um, probably the fifth time that I um, tried it out. The first couple of times that um, the mushrooms ended up becoming really jagged. I tried it without uh, no background, so I had to go through the data set and remove the backgrounds out of all the images of fungi to see how that turned out. Um, yeah, a lot of trial and error. Yeah, and what we're looking at here is, 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 is what it's actually the process of it working itself out basically working out what a mushroom is so it, rather than the end product it produces we're looking at it thinking essentially okay so that's yeah that's fascinating um so why why mushrooms i guess is 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 a question that comes to my mind why why is mushrooms as a subject matter for this um so mushrooms were actually is quite a last minute addition to my final project at uni um, at the start i uh, third year i started looking at facial recognition within um ai and um when looking at the certain languages about ai um it, i watched a video on paul stamets it was just i was watching a video to take a break from studying and he started talking about fungi and discussing certain terminology that I connected with artificial intelligence. So I just linked the two together. Okay, so you kind of saw this analogous kind of relationship between the organic networks of mushrooms through, through this talk and, and the kind of networks that you've been, you've been kind of uh, looking into for your own practice, basically. So it's like kind of a little eureka moment, I guess, when, when in research that you get sometimes. Um, so, so what what have been your main main kind of influences throughout the work? Um, what what's uh, what's led you to this to this way of working? Uh, one of my main influences, I have I went to a talk at Salford University, and a lady called Anna Riddler. She um, uses general adversary networks and artificial intelligence to create the same sort of thing. Uh, but she creates her own data sets. She did um, a whole data set on tulips to make her project mosaic virus. And that was a big inspiration because there was, wasn't many talks at the time when I was at university that was directly related to what I was studying um, in terms of fungi. So, yeah. Mm. OK, so, yeah, Anna Riddler. Yeah, I, I saw the same talk myself. And it was it was, uh, uh, again, using organic matter as a kind of using it as an analogy. And in her case, for for global economics, I, I seem to remember. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, uh, mushrooms, I mean, you really hit on something there because there's so much conversation about this kind of uh this uh until recently unknown network uh that that operates between trees etc and this you know this ancient network that, that that occurs in nature um so has your interest in mushrooms kind of flourished as a re result of you know this deep research that you've been doing into into this subject or, or has it just been a means to talk about or to uh, to make work related to AI. How how do you see your do your you know is your project going to be is your next project going to be about mushrooms? Is it is it something that's a growing fascination, or is it just you move on to another thing that can talk about AI in a more in another interesting way? Yeah, um, it is a big interest now. I do a lot of research on fungi. Um, my sister refers to me as a crazy mushroom lady. And <laughs> Uh, just makes jokes about it. Um, I was talking to you the other day about the podcast with Russell Brand and Merlin Sheldrake and he's got his new book Entangled Life and I need to read that but um, at the moment I'm going back to the basics of AI and coding and really learning how that works um, but I'm hoping 
that um, a spark will come again uh, when I'm doing my research and I think of another project. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, it, it comes quite organically, doesn't it? Much as mushrooms, mushrooms kind of grow quite organically in, in, in nature. So, okay. Um, so, yeah, there's, yeah. When did this kind of occur, really? This, this, because previously you've been a, a photographer who used a camera more in an observational way. Um, did, was there a transition when you were, when you were studying, when, when it suddenly became, this became a new way of working for you, new terrain to explore? Um, so uh, it was probably second year when I did my second year exhibition in the city um, when I started to use found imagery I was looking at a lot of surveillance and CCTV and um, I found a website online where um, it was thousands of unsecure live feeds and I found that really interesting but yeah I didn't take photographs myself it was found imagery online and um, yeah I never I never used to quite understand why people used um images that they had, hadn't taken themselves but i do understand now and through artists like mishka henna and you can create such big projects from sourced information on the internet i think it's really interesting yeah yeah it's definitely a fertile ground isn't it for for creating work at the moment um so yeah it's there's a kind of unavoidable hallucinogenic sort of quality to your to, to the piece and you know uh mushrooms are notorious for well, certain strains of mushrooms are notorious for their for their own hallucinogenic properties. And recent studies have shown that chemicals found in these strains open up new, new neural networks in the brain and can be an effective treatment for a range of psychological conditions, including depression, et cetera. Were these, were these factors a consideration during the making of the work? Because um, again, there's, there seem to be kind of parallels with your subject matter and, and the treatment of it. Yes, so uh, with the psychological conditions, it is um, known that certain microdosing can help um, certain health conditions um, and I did touch on the hallucinogenic fungi because um, I did a lot of research on Terence McKenna and his zone date theory uh, which is he's basically saying that at one point during our human evolution our ancestors found fungi um, the hallucinogenic kind and consumed them and he believed that this created a neural a reroute of our neural networks in our brains uh, which is how our brains develop today. Ah, okay. So that, that was actually fundamental in our evolutionary progress was, is one, one theory at least. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Okay. Thanks to Lula. We're just going to move on to um, Matthew now. Uh, Matthew's actually been commissioned to write a piece about Tallulah's work um, for, which will be featured in the First Light Tilt publication alongside uh, stills from Tallulah's, Tallulah's uh, project. So, uh, hi, Matthew. So, Hello. I just wanted to ask you really about how you approached uh, writing about Tallulah's work. Is this, is this something, you know, we, we did, we did uh, a pace of mind to how we paired artists and writers and made sure there were some, you know, uh, aligning of interest. So yeah, were you fam familiar with some of the themes it touches on? And uh, yeah, how did you, how did you, what was your approach to, to it? What did you want to do? Uh, yes, I was familiar, familiar with some of the themes it um, touched upon. Uh, the way I approached it was to, to uh, make it more accessible to the wider audience. And I could see uh, parallels with the way we are, um, or the way we're trying to cope with the COVID-19 um, crisis at the moment and the networks that we are creating as a consequence of that in these, this mushroom nature's internet. Mm. Um, so that that's how primarily how I um, approached it from that side of that side of the of the fence, so to speak. Mm. This is very difficult to to talk and put into and try to connect with the audience um, and to make this uh, fascinating subject. Um, uh, I, I think I actually had someone in mind who I'm actually writing for so they can actually understand it and yeah. that's how I approached um uh, the writing of my piece I, say. I see yeah so, so to make it accessible I mean it's a very visually mesmerizing piece but yeah, yeah to actually open up open it up to discussion I guess is a yes. is another yeah. challenge isn't it um yeah, to make as many questions as possible within the piece. yeah I see so yeah where did your research take you then and did it kind of stretch you as a as a writer and your and your knowledge 
it did uh, stretch me in terms of I, I already knew about things like forest bathing. I always knew, I knew about neural networks. And I can actually see um, uh, a connection between all, it's basically networks. So I can actually see that there, there is a, a, a seed of an idea in terms of connecting synapses, all kinds of networks together. Um, and that's how it stretched me in terms of trying to link all these um, things together in just a few hundred words, which is quite difficult. Um, yes. So uh, yes, that's that's, that's, that's that's yeah, it's a lot of things to tie in, isn't it? Yeah, and to, yeah. to 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 yeah. to to make a coherent case for what uh, a coherent inter interpretation of the work is. Yeah, that's the challenge within within that five hundred word kind of a yes, limit. Yes. But yeah, I think you've really achieved it, especially with uh, with that kind of personal. You bring the personal into it, which was uh, which will which will uh, hear shortly when you do your yeah. reading. Um, so. You're currently studying for an MA, and you're yeah. also a photographer. So that's uh, that's quite interesting that you're intertwining this your your writing and your photography. Is that is that something that is that something you, you're taking forward as as part of your practice? It's always been uh, a, a difficult part of the, the the photographic process. We all think that in in terms of uh, photography that you just go out there and you take photos, and it should be self-explanatory. That's what that particular thing is. But no, you, you have to have uh, a way in for the viewer to see what, that, what, what, I'm, what, what I'm trying to say, uh, my voice in these mm. images or series of images. Um, so that's one area that I've tried to basically kind of um, just concentrate on for about a year now, mm. not necessarily take too many photos. It'd be very difficult. <laughs> Because I just take I take photos all the time. I've got projects on the go all the time. So to just just sit down and write about the sometimes it, even the image making process has been quite difficult. You just yeah. concentrate on that, and away you go. You you writing about, about your, yeah, sorry, sorry, apologies. But writing about your own work can be can be a can be a you know a real challenge, can't it? Interpreting yeah. the work that you make. It's virtually impossible. I can write about other people's work, yeah. but not my own. It's because I'm. I, I think um, I'm so into it. It's difficult because I'm. Sometimes you're really excited about what you're doing. You can't actually think about what to write. You just, you just want to do. You just want to take the photos, and uh, and yeah. do the work. Really, you don't. You know, it's almost like. A, yeah, yeah. You just want to do the work, basically. Yeah, yeah. No, it's like self therapy in a way. A lot of the time, isn't it? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. If we could see some of your images, we, we we can share them with the audience that you've been taking. So usually, as as described in your bio, you you know you take pictures uh, commercially and you you take pictures of people. So it must have been a quite a, quite a strange year for you, having having to a, adapt to to the current you know the, the yes, different it, world. Oh, oh, terrible! These these um, photos. Show the the presence of people, even though they're not there. There's nobody there at all, apart from myself. There's nobody there at all. So it's quite liminal in that in that sense. Um, so and these are, these were desire paths, is that right? Is these that... are pathways of desire. Yeah, desire paths, pathways of desire. Mm. Um, so it shows the, the the trail. It shows what people have left behind, and it also shows um, the decision making process because you don't have to go down these paths. It's not a shortcut. People mm. decide to go there. Sometimes it, it isn't even um, a better view. It's just a way of exploring mm -hmm. uh, some parks and some uh, woodland areas. Yeah, making new networks, if you will. Well, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, so we'll return to that. I mean, it's interesting because we see we see this work reflected in your writing, actually, and you know how you have been reconnecting with nature. It really does shine through in, in the latter part of your text, which we'll be hearing about later. So, yeah, thank you, Matthew. That's great. Okay. Uh, so, just to bring Richard in at this point. Hi, Richard. Uh, hi. Hi. Yeah. So, so yeah, you've you've taught to Lula for a number of years, and you were the course leader leader on the course. Um, and you have your own practice as well um, as an observational photographer, shall we say, um, you know, you are uh, 
man in world with camera and uh, you still take pictures of of things in the world um so what do you yeah what do you make of the way technology has changed in recent years and yeah where, where do you what's your what's your what's your relationship to documentary photography as uh for, for want of a better term yeah yeah um yeah i mean it's kind of interesting i think because perhaps of all of the people that talk to, to do that my colleagues that i work with maybe my work's the least perhaps connected um to to, to what she does as you say I, I sort of i wander around with a camera <laughs> you know points pointed at the world um in that kind of observational way um you know i don't think these things are sort of mutually exclusive really um but um you know and i think also you know i've kind of sort of well the tenuous relationship with kind of documentary and, and the reality of the world really i think i can see that see the world as a, as a sort of piece of theater really and that that's kind of what it is i'm trying to kind of evoke in in the pictures mm -hmm. um the photographing the world in that way you know what perhaps was known as documentary you know and was a product of technology itself wasn't it you know the kind of mm. single viewpoint perspective um you know that, that that sort of came about and, and for me i'm interested in that really as a i suppose as a as a, as a kind of myth in itself you know I mean, this mm. sort of failure to that project you know really to, to sort of attempt to apprehend the world through photography has always been sort of rooted in in its in its own failure and i think that was denied for a long time but actually you know yeah or in fact most most sort of contemporary practices kind of embed that really as you know as it's as their sort of central um aim um i think that um i think photographing the world is important i think people want to do it mm -hmm. uh, i think people can't stop doing it actually it seems to be the problem um <laughs> <laughs> you know like one of the many statistics isn't it about however many billion pictures are uploaded every what is it every second now or something i don't know yeah but, um yeah, yeah. you know and it's like you try stopping people i guess um yeah so you know that that kind of image world is just continuing continuing isn't it to sort of expand and you know with it you know within that these practices um remain the i think that um you know the interesting thing around the um you know we find on the on on our on the course on the photography course you know we've got photographers that are doing straight photography and then we've got people doing all kinds of all kinds of stuff you know mm -hmm. um and you know i think we're always very kind of interested in really kind of exploring those sort of peripheral areas of photography you know like how we kind of come to understand it yeah so and, questioning the kind of definitions that that you know because you know there's it can be quite a narrow definition that people adhere to in terms of what photography is but you 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 in your course you are seeking to expand that and just question yeah what, what I mean, you're saying yeah exactly i mean i think you know the kind of what photography is the question is a sort of one that's very much yeah. at the heart of the course really um mm. and you know i think people come to the course with you know preconceived ideas you know and that will depend on a number of things um that depend on sort of you know how, what their experiences are um and um you know and this is a, this is some what photography is is kind of open to debate isn't it you know it's like and it's so it's going to change um you know and we and that's the interesting thing actually about the the technologies that are that are obviously changing it but challenging it actually aren't they you know um you know where once an image was made by light wasn't it but actually mm. not, not really so much anymore most of the commercial images we see not most of the a lot of the commercial images you know kind of computer generated aren't they and they look like they have a photographic realism you know and photography mm. become associated with a with a look a photographic look rather than you know an actual kind of corresponding relationship with reality mm. um and of course that's really interesting for someone who's interested in documentary you know yeah, you the yeah. World, um because it sort of challenges that and so i don't think these things are separate things they're just all part of the same sort of move, move, moving and morphing shape yeah. of, like to do this film you know? yeah absolutely it's <laughs> just blending from one thing to another perhaps. yeah i guess that it's always had a 
difficult or yeah just an interesting relationship to the truth or reality and this this, this continues that that debate and conversation i guess doesn't it in a sense uh yeah, so, the reality problem was, was always a problem for photography, wasn't it? You know, I mean, yeah, we always yeah. knew that, it, that you know, no real corresponding relationship between photography and reality. Um, and you know, digital technologies, in some senses, um, for a period of time, began to kind of cement it. You know, people became quite obsessed with oh, but manipulation and stuff like that. Well, actually, photography was always a manipulation. Yeah, it's just a look at the world, and that's a kind of manipulation. We see it in a very very particular way um, yeah and um, but i guess yeah now now with Tallulah's work i guess it's yeah um that that reference to the real world is is kind of becoming less apparent it's 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 you can produce something which is entirely new which is uh has no has no kind of indexical reference in 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 the real world i guess that's that's something that we're a new boundary we're crossing perhaps with mm. photography um so thanks everyone so far well, i thought we'd just bring everyone in really uh for this so there's some been some like fascinating topics covered already um and really kind of uh meaty topics philosophical questions that that Taluda's work raises um so yeah we just to, just to uh touch on an earlier point about the imagination of the computer uh, if that's what we're looking at, uh, as it tries to work out what a mushroom is. Uh, but it is simply a logical system that is following a set of mathematical instructions. It doesn't yet, at least, possess a consciousness, or that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the assumed view, uh, which does beg the, beg the age-old question, what exactly is this consciousness that, you know, what is our experience of reality, and what separates organic intelligence from AI? So, yeah, it's a big, big question. Obviously, we're not going to answer that. But, um, yeah, did you have any kind of thoughts about it, really? Tallulah, has that kind of crossed your mind in terms of, yeah, what, 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 this, uh, what this means for, for us and how we think about ourselves? The analysis of consciousness is a very, um, no one knows really, it's um, it's a state of being aware and responsive to like your surroundings. Um, so although the, my program was a machine, um, I've told it what to understand or what to identify just as a, a parent tells their child, oh, this is a banana or this is an apple, just like I'm telling um, the computer the same thing. So mm. yeah. Yeah, so it's in its kind of infant stages, I guess, AI at the moment. But yeah, there is there is again an analogy with with that parent uh, child kind of relationship, I guess, where we're we're feeding it information, and from that information, it produces new ideas or yeah, new images in this case. Uh, Richard or Matthew, have you got any kind of takes on this? What what are, are we so far from from AI? What what what's your what's your take on it? Ooh. you can't put the genie back into the bottle it's out there it's up to us to, to a certain extent um, control it uh, and I think it's to do with the code and the biases behind the code yeah, if there are any biases behind the code um, yes yeah, it's, it's difficult with, with AI in terms of um, there are certain parts of the, of the world that will embrace it, so, so, so don't really need AI. I mean, do we need AI in this country? Do, do it's other countries as well. Do they really need it, or, or are we going to sell that to them? So the economic uh, aspect of it might cut, it might be the driving force in developing it in a particular way. So yeah, Richard. Throw that out there. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> So yeah, what would you think, Richard, in terms of yeah the future of AI? I think we yeah. were talking about Clara and the Sun the other day. Uh, yeah, which was... yeah. I mean, I just think there, there's such a fascination in popular culture, isn't there? And there has been for, for years and years and years, you know. And um, you know, I think that things like this, you know, where we, you know, you know Toulouse providing a kind of provocation, really, you know, like if the computer can dream <laughs> imagery, you know, <laughs> yeah, by being fed loads of images. Well, it's kind of what our dreams are, aren't they? You know, previous stimuli, I suppose, I mean, you know, depending on which theory you read, but, you know, stimuli throughout the day that gets kind of regurgitated and create, you know, creates new new thoughts. And I, and I think there's, there's this 
so it's two ways of looking at it. I will imagine how, you know, in the future and, and AI and what we'll achieve. And there's another way of looking at it. And it's like, well, what if we're just like, <laughs> what, what if all we are are just these kind of like electronic um, signals firing in a, in a, in a, in a sort of head full of meat? Um, you know, <laughs> what, what if that is? What it is you know, and Whatever that is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's also kind of like, I think, kind of compelling that actually there's as much about our own limitations as there is. The, the advancements of technologies the yeah that we need ai we've survived to this point 7th of june do we need ai i suppose in the way that i should be the, we don't need it really well, yeah, we survived i'm oh, sorry we carry on richard go on to the, go on to the, the, um, the thing. they do use it not just art they don't just use it for art like me um, <laughs> people do use it for science they have um they've many scientific breakthroughs by using AI and feeding it information and um, yeah there's a lot a lot of things you can use it for um, transport medical reasons educational reasons I think there's a lot of um, things that can be good for but it is scary because I think technology does scare a lot of people um, it can be a bad thing mm. we, might as, we might as well utilize it and make it a good thing and make it used for being good yeah, yeah but it's okay. that it's, it's that uh, the positivity uh, of youth I think that was. <laughs> <It's> that <description. laughs> it can be a bad thing there are certain things that i consider a bad thing that you might consider not a bad thing as well as that it's that fine line isn't it well yeah it depends on the it depends on who's writing who's producing the machine i guess because it is yeah. as we as we mentioned it perfectly reflects the what we feed into it um and our own biases perhaps sorry richard yeah what did you what did you have to say previously no, I can't <laughs> not, to put, not to put you on the spot no i can't remember <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah i mean i think this idea of oh it, it, it only it only remembers you know what we feed into it and is, that's true of of us as well, isn't it? You know, it's mm. uh, earlier when Tilly was talking about oh, we're teaching the machine to, um, to you know, to see images of mushrooms and that part of I kind of don't really mean this if any of my students are watching, but you know, it's just <laughs> <laughs> kind of what you do, isn't it? You know, I teach for sort of <laughs> teachers, teaching, teaching people how to make, you know, not like that, like this. Um, and, and, and actually, but education was like that for years, wasn't it? You know, like, teaching people how to make images that look like a certain way that they might be accepted or fit into this context, you know, mm. um, and, and the, that, that is kind of sort of like ideology is, isn't it? You know, they are, we are, we, we I take, narrator you, we, we take pictures that look like a certain sort of thing quite often that we've seen before, you know, um, and, um, and if we if were to manage to take something totally wholly original, no one would mm. recognize it. Because, you know, However, I'm going to throw something in there, like a hand grenade. If we, if we taught uh, a machine to uh, uh, take some photos of a banana, but in the actual, in the field, we say it was an orange, would it come out and say that it's a banana or an orange? Or would this, would this, this <laughs> sorry, this is <laughs> my whole thing up now. No, it's just the way people, see the world that's you know it's it's trying to um uh, it's what you feed in in terms of this is good and this is bad that type of thing yeah it's how you it's it's certainly how you label it i mean i'm assuming if you teach yeah. a banana uh, an orange looks like a banana then the computer is going to think an orange looks like a banana <laughs> yeah uh, erroneously you said it better than me yeah <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it depends on you know that that just makes for a bad, a bad bad teaching, I guess. <laughs> <In terms of that. laughs> uh, but it does definitely throw out some really interesting ethical questions about uh, which has some parallels with you know early Victorian photography, early documentary photography um, around authorship, um, the categorization of 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 of, of of people, uh, dynamics of power. Yeah, do, do, do you see some problems on the horizon, anyone, in terms of how this, is, and has that affected your work at all, Tallulah? Uh, it did affect my work. Um, I didn't do uh, 
my project just before I chose the fungi, it was a quite a last minute thing. Um, the fungi, I was doing a facial recognition program that I wanted to show in a degree show. Um, and it was detecting people's emotions. And um, when I started looking around the more ethical issues surrounding facial recognition and the problems I was actually looking at to start with around surveillance in CCTV, um, I started to get quite worried. So I decided to change my mind because I really didn't want to offend anyone at the degree show because if my program didn't detect someone's face or misinterpret their mood, then um, I wouldn't want it to come back on me as an artist. So I stopped doing it. Yeah, okay. So that's interesting. You kind of exercised a little bit of self-censorship in your work, I guess, because you're concerned as to how, how, how the computer might you know offend or or impact your impact stages for me programming i didn't know how to quite get it um, yeah up to scratch so yeah yeah what would you what do you make of that richard in terms of yeah how how the how the computer can can uh reflect yeah um ideologies which aren't which aren't you know which aren't uh acceptable perhaps in, in society or uh, yeah, I mean, I remember when, when Dulu was developing it and, um, you know, yeah, with, with the facial recognition stuff, you know, yeah. and it is fascinating. I mean, like, and we, and we worry terribly about, like, oh, the ethical consequences of that, but I'm mm. fairly sure the Metropolitan Police aren't. Um, you know, right? <laughs> we walk around these cities, Whoa. you know, and, and, it, and we're getting clocked, you know, um, you know, on a daily basis and um if they are worrying about it now I and mean, one wonders what you know it's becoming you know commonplace isn't it and mm -hmm. you know, it's easy to say oh there's a sort of slippery slope but um, our phones do it now you know my yes go on to i photo and you know there's pictures of friends and then the camp you know the folders are already made for you aren't they the phone yeah. knows who you know the different faces of your friends and stuff <laughs> yeah. um and you didn't ask it to um and so the you know sophistication around that software is is, is increasingly more so, isn't it? Um, the interesting thing for me ethically is I don't know about AI, but you know, is this idea of the algorithmic sort of component of this really? You know, so the so every port picture that's taken on your phone is kind of recognised, but every phone is connected to everything else, and and you know, we of course all of this stuff, every image could be networked couldn't it in exactly the same way it is networked but um and you, you you were asking me earlier about the kind of observer of the world that i do with the autonomous photographer looking at the world and, mm. and actually that doesn't happen anymore because all those pictures will be networked i think you know and um th th and that's that kind of algorithmic culture is kind of what is um more more daunting i think you know mm. I think you know, um, and, um, and uh, well, algorithms generally, and how that they, you know, in, in embed ideologies and you know encourage mm -hmm. us to see see this. You know, we're training computers to see mushrooms, but you know, my Facebook feed is doing virtually that. You know, constantly mm -hmm. feeding me certain certain stuff that I might like, and, <laughs> and you know, and and um, yeah, I think that's really kind of. Um, you know, really, really, really kind of fascinating. Yeah, I guess that's the job of, you know, work like Tallulah's just because mm. we do we do just accept it blindly these days. And we, you know, just take it very much for granted that all these things are just doing the in incredible algorithmic things in the background and basically uh, directing our, our lives to some extent. Um, so, yeah, it's just, just just any work which highlights that, I guess, and, and causes us to to reflect on what's actually happening is, uh, is, is very valuable. Um, so yeah, which takes us back to Matthew. We're, we're yeah, we're gonna hear a reading from you now. And this is, yeah, yeah, the piece is fantastic as it, as it draws these parallels between the, the, the kind of networked network, the ancient networks that we, that we live in, live on and the, uh, the coexisting kind of synthetic networks that we're developing. So yeah, if we, Whenever you're ready, Matthew. Um, this this uh, piece, I should say, for audiences will yeah feature in the Tilt publication, which will be launched um, if restrictions are lifted on the 24th of June. Um, so, 
Okay, whenever you're ready, Matthew, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, nature's internet. Um, we humans use networks all the time, like talking, not talking, body language, and the ever-present internet. Less obviously, to us at least, so do plants and fungi. This is nature's internet. As Tian Gan, postdoctoral researcher with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, puts it, because of their connection to terrestrial plants and important nutritional cycles, terrestrial fungi have a driving influence on biochemical weathering, the global biogeochemical cycle and ecological interaction. Fungi connects the complex systems around us that makes all life possible. Likewise, our communication devices depend on algorithms to function, algorithm design, referring to a method or a mathematical process for problem solving. Whether we are on the net, see monetization, i.e. the process of converting something into money or not. So Luna Green was Nature's Internet, a film about the life cycle of fungi, uses thousands of images sourced online to form a mushroom data set. Greenwood gave these images to, again, a generative adversarial network, a machine learning model that creates new databases. Once trained, Hergan was able to conceive of imaginary mushrooms out of the original source materials. It was able, in a sense, to bring new life, albeit fictional, into existence. In a way, Greenwood's process mirrors the algorithms ascribed to us with our acceptances, compliance of end user license agreements as we click, like, and share. It is the story of our everyday lives. See for yourself, request a file of all your Google interactions and you'll run out of paper before you run out of downloaded data. We go about our daily business and this now new natural communication is going on all around us. Greenwood reveals and focuses on this process with her own motion capture technique. Nature's internet focuses on the minutiae in nature is pretty relevant given the news cycle, the 24 hour COVID-19 viral network and the, re the resonance it has on our lives. The link between art, science and experimentation is nicely encompassed in this very short film. All aspects of life are prevalent, birth, regeneration, and the simple but powerful need to survive. Greenwood's work is more about communica communicating our fragility, our impermanence, than merely showcasing what an internet device is, is capable of. We've all felt it during lockdown, locked out of an organic social network and forced into a cynical silicon one. We are, avatars, avatar, we are avatars for more and more hours of the day, mentally disconnected from the physical tactile world, yet, like the 2009 film Avatar, biologically connected, whether we think it or not. All organisms are connected. We react, communicate, grow and manage resources. I hang on to the knowledge that nature's internet is still plowing on without our acknowledgement. On my daily walks, I think about Shinrin Yoku or forest bathing, something that has definitely de-stressed me during the last year and made me feel more connected. Maybe it's all those mushrooms acting in my favor as I stroll through the local park, musing on all the energy of life and death beneath my feet. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Matthew. Wonderful. Thank you. That's brilliant. It's uh, yeah, you've successfully kind of weaved in a lot of the lot of the ideas that uh, we've been talking about, really. So, yeah, a brilliant response to the work. Um, so, we're going to go to Q and A's now. Uh, we'll see what questions we have uh, for for each of you. Uh, so yeah, so we've got the first question here. Um, I would love to ask Tallulah and Matthew about how they found the collaborative process. So that's to both of you. Uh, maybe we start with Tallulah first. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I mean, I thought it was fine. I think the hardest part was discussing, trying to find a time where we could both sit down and, and um, talk about it enough. So I thought the best way um, to get 
Matthew across with my work was to send him all my initial research all my research methods everything that I had um, which I didn't expect him to read at all but he did so I think he fully understood where I was coming from with everything because um, yeah he read everything in depth. Excellent excellent so yeah he did a, he did a thorough job on it. Uh, how, how about you Matthew what did you how did you find the uh can I just say that that there's a lot of research materials there and there was a lot to read, but it was very <laughs> enjoyable. I enjoyed it. Um, I find it very in uh, uh, easier to write about somebody else's work. So it was, uh, and, and this is a particular subject I'm very interested in. So I was on board anyway. So it was, it was, I found it um, uh, uh, quite an enjoyable, but difficult um uh, way to get things across to mm -hmm. make it more accessible as I said before um, yes but I enjoyed it it was good yeah yeah so yeah a, a nice brief really for yes it, it, yes excellent so um, next question another one for Tallulah uh, what are you working on at the moment and how do you see this project developing if yeah is this I think we covered it slightly earlier but yeah do you, do you see it uh, moving on beyond beyond uh, in, in this way of working, in this way of coding, I guess, in general, but perhaps, yeah, with um, with mushroom species in, in specifically, yeah. Yeah, um, I definitely want to carry on with machine learning models, um, but obviously I only started it um, about two months before my final hand in, so um, I'm, I'm very basic when it comes to programming coding, so I'm really going back to the, the basics of that first, but yeah, I'd love to um, add on to my fungi project. There's so much information on fungi, so should be able to make enough work around it. Okay, that kind of leads on to the next question nicely, actually. So, um, yeah, is this are you learning coding to, to specifically just develop your photography practice? And yeah, how does how do you, how do you see it playing out in future projects? Is this uh, is this a brand new, is this, is this more your focus now rather than photography? I guess this is uh, the, the, the area of computing. Yeah, so um, I'm looking at doing a master's degree um, in creative computing. So I'm hoping that um, I need to learn more about it before I go on to do a master's about it, um, but yeah. Okay, so you, you're due to start a master's in September, are you? You're gonna- uh... No, not this September. No, okay. this September, I'm giving okay. a little break. <laughs> in, in 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 fine art or in photography or yeah what which okay. direction uh, in photography uh, creative okay arts, creative arts com creative computing i see okay so yeah so in the meantime you're going to brush up on your coding and yeah i mean it's 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 just a good tool to have i guess isn't it in this yeah. uh, in this day and age good to be uh coding literate you know as a language um okay so i've got a fascinating question from Greg Leach here. Uh, the brief glimpse of Tallulah's work reminded me of time-lapse photography and by extension, the process of evolution itself. Is there, an analogy, is there an analogy between evolution and the development of AI perhaps? How do we, what, what do you think about that guys? Any, any thoughts there? I mean, that, that immediately makes me think of 2001, the film really. And, uh, and you know, we see that evolution of man and AI as being the kind of next logical step in our in our in our in our progress um and it seems to be playing out now would you guys would you guys agree in some sense yeah so i, I think um ai it's uh, can, it can develop by itself as soon as long as you program it it can keep relearning by itself so um it can almost predict things that we can't predict ourselves if that mm. makes sense through the information we fed it okay so we're, we're kind of actively seeing seeing it develop before our eyes basically quite quickly as well i think yeah uh matthew or richard have you got any thoughts on that at all in terms of yeah where, where it's i think we're in the baby steps of ai uh, very early uh, early in the process and we're we are actually going to make quite a few mistakes uh possibly along the way you know the, the ethic implications are quite um profound so um i think it's we think about the the actual uh, what what we really want ai to do as well what the what the 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 goal is maybe we haven't got a goal for ai we've got the medical aspects but we haven't got an overall um uh, goal 
it looks to me like they're using AI just for virtually everything and anything because it sounds good. Yeah, it's got a lot of applications, isn't yeah. it, at the moment? And yeah. we're just kind of muddling through, I guess, yeah. in terms of the ethical side of things. Um, okay, I think that's all for the questions for now. So that is a good time to wrap it up at this point. Uh, thanks to all of our guests. It's been another fascinating uh, session of um, First Light Spotlight. And I think it's a real testament to the to the work, really, where whereby we get to talk about these 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 this fascinating it opens up discussions to to about all these fascinating subjects so uh yeah thanks everyone thank you matthew thank you richard thank you Tallulah. uh thanks to everyone at open eye and waterside also and all our project partners at village lead spectrum photographic nq photo studio and of course to natalie at open eye gallery for the smooth running of the show behind the scenes as always uh, thanks also to everyone out there who has tuned in tonight and to all our previous talks. We really appreciate you spending your evenings with us. In a fortnight on the 22nd of June, we will have the very last First Light Spotlight entitled Interior Tension, uh, which will feature Kaylee Clements. Uh, the recent experience of lockdown clipped many of our horizons to within our immediate domestic surroundings, our homes become, becoming the limited stage on which our shrunken lives played out. Photographer Kaylee Clemenson, seeing dramatic potential in this new reality, turned her lens inwards to capture the quietly heightened atmosphere of lives under lockdown in her own family home. We'll be joined by Kaylee, as well as her former tutor David Lockwood and writer Adrienne Wilkinson, who has written a wonderful text responding to Kaylee's work. So the exhibition continues until the 4th of July at Castlefield New Art Spaces in Warrington, so please do come and visit us. I'm there every Thursday if you want to pop in and say hello. Uh, more details about the venue and how to get there can be found on at firstlight.photo on Instagram. Uh, so do, and on Waterside website as well. So do follow us along there. So until next time, thank you very much and good night. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you.